There may be three things you probably fear reading about these days. The outcome of your college midterm exams, the daily news, and your gas and electric bill. For the first two, nothing to say, sorry, it happens. As for the rising bills, yes, that happens too, but for specific reasons, and you're not too wrong. When we talk about gas and electricity, we are referring to what provides us with a basic standard of living. Heating, hot water, electricity and gas for cooking. In short, your domestic hearth. Not to mention, of course, those factories who cannot work without gas and electricity. Let's start with the harsh reality. The entire European Union is not self-sufficient in energy, which means a dense network of imports. Of course, if Norway was an EU country, we might consider it an anomaly. Over there, they produce plenty of gas. 101 billion cubic meters of gas in 2012, which they don't even use. They only make do with 4 billion since they managed to get by with hydroelectricity and burning churches. In fact, in 2012 they exported something like 110 billion cubic meters of gas. There's actually a European champion for gas production, or rather, there was. We're talking about the Netherlands, which a decade ago was around 70 billion cubic meters of gas produced. There's a small problem, however. A bit like the dwarves of Moria, the Dutch have dug too deep, causing seismic damage related to drilling. The large Groningen plant will close soon, but the production has already been drastically reduced down to 20 billion cubic meters. And if there is a fourth thing you would absolutely not want to see, this is the map of the gas pipelines that cross the old continent. Where and how do these billions of cubic meters of gas arrive in the homes of us Europeans? Non-European natural gas comes for 43.9% from Russia, 19.9% from Norway, 11.9% from Algeria, 5.5% from UK, 5% from the US, and a remaining 13.8% from other countries such as Azerbaijan, Qatar, Libya, Nigeria, Trinidad and Tobago. These are the main countries that extract and sell their gas to us today, both in natural form and LNG, there is the liquefied gas. The undisputed queen, or rather the Tsarina, is Russia. Much of the gas exported to the old continent is extracted from the fields of the Yamal Peninsula in northwestern Siberia. It's here that we find the famous steppes, more precisely near the pleasant town of Novi Urengoy. And here the mess begins. From Novi Urengoy, the Northern Lights pipeline starts and proceeds unhindered to the town of Tordzok, northwest of Moscow. Here two things happen. The pipeline continues towards Belarus on the Smolensk-Minsk directive, where it splits. One part continues north, towards Lithuania and then Kaliningrad, and another path to the south, towards western Ukraine. At Torzok, the Northern Lights pipeline also joins a second pipeline, the Yamal Europe, which passes through Minsk and Poland to the German border at Libus, where it joins the German Jagal system. The Urengoi Pomari Uzgorod, known as the Brotherhood, also departs from Novi Urengoi, with a 4,400 km long snake that crosses Ukraine and reaches the Slovakian border in parallel with the Soyuz which departs to the south from Orenburg. On the one hand, there's Belarus, through which the gas that feeds Germany and therefore northwestern Europe passes, and on the other side, there's Ukraine, the gateway through which the traffic for Balkan and southern Europe flows. But there's more. Yep, in fact, a branch of the Brotherhood flows to Novopskov, in the Luhansk People's Republic, from which it then reconnects to the Ukrainian network up to Kyiv, crossing basically the whole country. But let's pretend that in Donbass everything is regular and no war is going on. There are in fact other Russian routes that reach Europe by passing Ukraine and Belarus. Well, Europe up to a certain point, if we talk about the Turk Stream pipeline, which from Anapa, on the shores of the Black Sea with a privileged view on Crimea, reaches Turkey at Ipsa, where it evolves into Turk Stream 2, running up the continent up to Hungary. The same applies to the Blue Stream, which crosses the Black Sea from Izobilny plant to reach Ankara directly. The Anatolian Corridor is really interesting, especially for us Italians, since we rely on Russian gas for about 40%. We are talking about the Trans-Adriatic Gas Pipeline, the TAP active since the end of 2012 that will connect Italy, more precisely the receiving terminal of Meladunio in Apulia, straight to the rich field of Shahadenis in Azerbaijan on the coast of the Caspian Sea. 
The TAP passes through Albania and crosses Greek Macedonia to Kipoi on the Turkish border. There it connects to TANAP, the Trans-Anatolian Pipeline, all the way to Georgia, where it finally attaches to the South Caucasian Pipeline. In 2021, 7 billion cubic meters passed through Meladunio. But we're not done with Russia yet. We need to talk about Nord Stream. Active since 2011, Nord Stream creates a direct supply line between Viborg in Russia and Griebswald in Germany, passing under the Baltic Sea. Attaching to the Grezovets Viborg pipeline, Nord Stream supplies some of the gas that passes through the Northern Lights. Something like 55 billion cubic meters per year can pass through Nord Stream, although some European sanctions on Gazprom have reduced its actual capacity by half. <laughs> What's the deal? Let's just build another one, right? In September, the controversial project of Nord Stream 2 was completed, an almost parallel pipeline which instead of Viborg it connects to Ustluga, and that would double the direct supply capacity of Germany from Russia, with around 110 billion cubic meters if all goes well. And why should anything ever go wrong? Well, the list of use against the Nord Stream 2 is quite long, and then we should also consider that the Nord Stream 2 company based in Switzerland went bankrupt day before yesterday. Thank you, sanctions. First of all, the project contradicts the common energy policy that the European Union is trying to pursue, diversifying its supplies to free itself from Russian dependence. Russia, on the contrary, would see in the potential of Nord Stream 1 and 2 an alternative channel to the compulsory steps of Belarus and especially Ukraine. This would offer Moscow a fearsome weapon of blackmail and influence on its neighbors. And it's not only Ukraine that's involved, because Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Poland are all in this game. Putin could knock on Kyiv's door and impose his conditions. Otherwise, no more gas through Ukraine, because me, Russia, can bring it straight to Germany. Diversification doesn't mean simply changing course, but finding other supplies. However, there's another detail which is rather disturbing. The company that will operate the new pipeline, Nord Stream 2 Aggie, based in Switzerland, is totally owned by Gazprom International Projects LLC, a branch of Gazprom itself. Nord Stream 2 Aggie is all that remains of the joint venture formed by, in addition to Gazprom, Eon, Shell, Wintershall, OMV and NG, a consortium later blocked by the Polish antitrust authorities. These former partners are now outside Nord Stream 2 Agi, but they have given substantial amounts of money as sponsors. The management of Nord Stream 2 by Gazprom alone, in addition to giving even more centrality to Russia, would go against the European energy policies that prevent suppliers from controlling the energy transmission networks. And one of the first nations to risk the consequences of Nord Stream 2 is Poland. But Poland has already run for cover. Yes, because fortunately for Europe, next to the monopolized Baltic Sea, there's another sea, rich in deposits. The North Sea. On this year, work should begin on the Baltic Pipeline, a pipeline that will connect the northern coasts of Poland to the heart of the Northern Sea, passing through Denmark and attaching itself to the network with which Norway supplies Western Europe and the United Kingdom. And here we come to our two not too much European country. What the UK and Norway have done in the North Sea may at first seem like a complete mess. The North Sea is full of gas fields that the two countries have long shared. But Norway also has rich deposits close to the Arctic, in the waters north of Trondheim. As we have seen, Norway exports almost all of the gas it extracts, and pipelines to the UK depart from the Arctic, such as the Longled pipeline to Loftus on the coast of North Yorkshire, and the parallel Ormen Langefield Easington pipeline. The coasts between Bergen and Stavanger represent a real hub, where gas extracted from the northern North Sea and the Arctic is redirected to continental Europe, through pipelines such as Z-Pipe in Belgium or Europipe 2, which connects Stavanger to the Dutch coast. The Netherlands and Belgium are, however, largely supplied by the many Norwegian extraction sites located in the south waters of the North Sea. And then there's the United Kingdom, which has some problems. It extracts plenty of gas compared to the European average. In 2012 it was about 40 billion cubic meters. But it consumed almost twice as much, 72 billion according to Eurostat. The biggest issue, however, is the lack of an adequate storage network. This is why UK has few supplies. This is also due to the shutdown of the rough plant in 1217, which alone for 30 years accounted for 70% of the country's storage capacity. 
In any case, there are three main hubs towards which the flows of British gas and imported quotas from Norway are condensed. Aberdeen, North Yorkshire and Beckton in North Norfolk. From these three nodal points, the UK national network is supplied. This includes as well the three main terminals from which LNG is exported and imported by sea. Milford Haven in Wales, the Grain LNG terminal on the island of Grain in Kent and in Middlesbrough. For many people, LNG is a solution to the excessive dependence on Russian gas, a solution that is certainly more expensive than transportation by pipelines. But which is more adaptable and no longer bound by geographical proximity. But it does not have only positive aspects. Yeah, sure, it's fine to replace Russia and Nord Stream, but the arrival of ships loaded with LNG from the US also has repercussions on the honest Norwegian exporters. If the Russian pipeline policy is threatening the European geopolitical and economic balance, the American involvement is no less. In the LNG routes, not only the United States are involved, of course. Spanish ports, Marseille, Rotterdam, Athens, these are the main destinations of LNG coming from Qatar, Nigeria and Trinidad and Tobago. Even we Italians, so thirsty for gas, have important LNG imports terminals in La Spezia, Livorno and in the Adriatic Sea. Adriatic Sea, which is well supplied with fields that are not much exploited by our workforce. After all, it looks really awful to go to the sea and see the Italian floating stations on the horizon. Much better the Croatian ones, right? We Italians have also another interesting route in the Mediterranean Sea. In the heart of the Algerian desert lies the largest African gas field, Hasir Mel. This gas oasis is the starting point for three very important gas pipelines for Southern Europe. On the one hand, there are the two Maghreb Europe and Medgaz pipeline, which cross Morocco and the Mediterranean to supply Spain. On the other hand, the Trans-Mediterranean pipeline, which crosses Tunisia and arrives in Sicily, at Mazzara del Vallo, and then climbs the entire peninsula as far as Slovenia. From Libya on the tripoli Gela route comes the Green Stream. There's also the interesting project of Galsi, gas pipeline Algeria Sardinia Italy, that from the Algerian Gulf of Annaba should bring gas to Sardinia and from there to Tuscany. But the southern route doesn't end in Africa. There has been talk for some years of a gas pipeline, the East Med, which from the fields in the eastern Mediterranean Sea between Cyprus and Israel should run to Greece between Crete and the Peloponnese, and then it should enter our Adriatic Sea through the Poseidon pipeline up to Otranto. Erdogan permitting. The Turks have different views on the Cyprus fields, as well as a different understanding of exclusive economic zones in the Mediterranean Sea. So we have come to the end of this exciting trip up and down Europe. Exciting. Rising bills could be a rather long-lasting reality if certain measures are not taken, but I'm certainly not the best person to explain them to you. I leave you some links in the description so you can have a look at the European gas pipeline mess. <laughs> this video could have been much worse. In the meantime, I just say thank you for listening to me until the end and see you next time. Ciao.